Greetings, everyone. This is Katie Campbell. I'm with um, I'm an independent consultant here in Richmond, Virginia, and my entire career has been focused on this topic of strategic volunteer engagement. I'm also um, somewhat familiar with the Main Street program, and so I'm delighted to be able to bring you this information to help you do your work perhaps a little bit more effectively, um, which benefits all of us here in the communities across Virginia. So just want to make a couple of comments about the content today. Um, you may be very experienced at working with volunteers or it may be fairly new to you um, in that role in your organization. So the content here will be a familiar refresher for some of you and may be quite new to others. I also recognize that many Main Street programs are smaller in size in terms of your staffing, especially. So some of what I'm sharing may be a little bit more structured or, or quote, advanced than you need. However, I believe that it all can be useful to you at least to spark your thinking about how you lead and work with volunteers and maybe provide a few new ideas for you to consider. In addition to this video and what you're going to hear here today, um, we also have a resource toolkit. And this is a um, document that has lots of additional resources in it, practical tools, templates, tip sheets, and samples. There is a QR code here. You can download it. Um, I'm going to refer to specific pages in the toolkit as we proceed through the slides. So feel free to download it now and keep it open during the video. And obviously you can also explore it more thoroughly on your own later on. So to get started, I want to share with you this framework. This is the um, way we're going to organize our information today. And there's actually an expanded version of this same uh, graphic on page one of the toolkit. All four of the components in the outer circle are necessary in order to achieve what's in the middle there. So we have to get ready for volunteers and do a planning, some planning practices, we then are ready to invite volunteers to get involved with our organizations and this focuses on recruitment and onboarding. Once they're in place, we then move to needing to support them, make sure they have what they need and that the work is getting done uh, well and um, dealing with any issues that might come up in terms of their uh, involvement. And then lastly, in the purple circle, we have the practices related to documenting what volunteers are doing and communicating the impact that they are having on our mission. All of those four sets of practices or buckets um, have to be done in order for two things to happen. And that's what you see in the center of the circle. Impact, what that means is that the work you need to get done gets done and helps to move your mission forward. And secondly, that volunteers have a positive and meaningful experience and are likely to therefore sustain their relationship with your organization. So we're going to go through each of those four outer buckets during this video. And I want to also encourage you to keep in mind that most if not all of these practices apply to board volunteers as well. So you may want to add that to your uh, context when you're listening. So to jump into that planning bucket, um, first of all, it's important to understand today's volunteer landscape. These are the trends that we have seen for a while and are still very strong, um, even after COVID and all that disruption. People still have a very strong motivation to help others and a strong desire to connect with other people. There's a very strong expectation that you're going to give me meaningful work to do. High interest in skills-based opportunities. In other words, 
those roles and activities which require professional skills or a high level of technical skill. High demand for demonstrating impact, and you're going to hear this as a theme throughout this uh, training. Volunteers want to know that what they're doing with you is going to make a difference, and we need to be sure we are articulating that to them and helping them to understand that. Of course, it's important to appreciate their service. There is still a need for staff supervision and support. And policies are a critical tool in our toolkit, uh, in our, in our uh, repertoire, in terms of uh, making sure that we are practicing good risk management and being consistent in our practices. And finally, volunteers must be held accountable and they want to be held accountable so we mustn't be afraid of that. In short, what all of this boils down to is that the effective leadership and management of our volunteer resources still matters a great deal. All right, when none of you are new to working with volunteers in your organization, I'm sure, um, but there are still planning questions that are helpful to ask. So start where you are and um, and periodically it's valuable to revisit these kinds of questions, even though you've had volunteers evolved for a while. Think about your organization's own current pool of volunteers. Why do we need them? What value do they add? Do they expand our impact? Are they increasing donations, boosting our visibility, serving as, as ambassadors in the community? all those things. Who are your current volunteers? Um, the, the age, the, the education level, the background, the geography, the ethnicity, you know, what's the profile of your current pool? And um, are there people that we could potentially reach out to and recruit, um, but perhaps have not uh, focused on that yet? And if not, why, why not? Where are current volunteers involved? What are they doing for us now? How are they involved? And are there gaps either in who's volunteering or what they are doing for us? So these are important planning questions to revisit as we want to be more strategic about our um, human resources. It's there are obviously lots of options for how volunteers can get involved in nonprofit organizations. And on the um, so it's important to remember that there's these different types of involvement and we can tap into any of them that we want to. In terms of the activity that volunteers are doing, direct service, of course, is usually a term implied um, that, that volunteers are working directly with the beneficiaries of your organization or your clients or your customers. Um, administration activity has to do with sort of the back office uh, operation of your organization. Maybe your bookkeeping, maybe your data tracking, uh, maybe your marketing or publicity. The governance activity happens at the board level we have to remember board members are volunteers too. And then many organizations, many nonprofits have volunteers involved in advocacy as well. Time span. Volunteers have all different kinds of schedules. So they can participate for one day with us seasonally, short term or episodically, and also on a more regular basis. And then we have other classes of folks who are perhaps ordered by the court to do community service or required by a class or expected by an employer. So all of those are uh, ways in which people come to us as well. These, this part of planning, after we've done some of that initial thinking, leads us to, the to needing to decide what we want volunteers to do and what we need them to do. I would caution you against starting with the question, how can volunteers help us? 
because the answer to that question will be limited by assumptions and perceptions of what volunteers can and cannot do. But if you start with questions like these on the slide, it helps to focus your thinking around the work that needs to be done to benefit the organization first. And then you can move to explore whether any of those needs might be filled by a volunteer. One way to start this conversation with individuals and st staff and or key volunteers who've been with you for a while is to ask them to look at their own job description and consider questions like these. I especially love the last one. If you had the resources, if I was offering you money to hire some part-time help, who would you hire? What skills would you want him or her to have and why? Now, that should be a pretty easy question for most people to answer. But again, we haven't mentioned the volunteer word yet. So start out with questions that focus on work first and tasks, and then you can move on to explore um, the possibility of delegating some of this to a volunteer. Well-crafted volunteer position descriptions are an essential foundational piece that also needs to be done during this particular phase of planning and getting ready for volunteers. We don't use the word job description like you would in the paid world. Um, it's better to say volunteer service description, role description, or position description. These should be written in a consistent style or format and they need to be able to be used in email communication, hard copy form, and on your website. You can have a volunteer help with updating your position descriptions and then reviewing them periodically. These are so foundational because they're used to help align your volunteer activities with your mission priorities. It's a huge help in recruitment, it's a way to hold volunteers accountable as well. Very, very similar to what happens in the paid world. So what goes into a volunteer position description? This is a list of the types of information that we recommend be included. You can call these different headings whatever you want to call them, um, but this is the kind of information that volunteers are going to want to know uh, when they are considering how to volunteer with you. None of us would take a paying job without a job description and volunteers are very hesitant to say yes to a general, um, yeah, come help us with this event. They want to know specifically uh, what their responsibilities are going to be, what your expectations are, if there are any skills um, required, what's the time commitment, where is this going to happen, and what kind of support am I going to have? So lots of flexibility about format, um, and it's important once you dra get these drafted that you show them to an outsider, somebody like me, <laughs> your, your um, your spouse maybe, or your um, college friend that who lives across the country, somebody who's not familiar with your work um, with Main Street, and see if it makes sense to them, because we want these to be very clear to a quote inside outsider. Okay, now to reference what's in the toolkit related to this, there's a template for, for developing a new role description based on these elements on page four. And then on pages five, six, and seven, there are several examples to illustrate different formats and styles and language. So you can use those, develop your own consistent format, and then use it for all your volunteer role descriptions. The last piece in this planning phase that I want to touch on is relates to managing risks. Many people, when they hear the words risk management, assume that it relates only to screening or insurance, but it actually involves much more. When it comes to our volunteers, there are many practices which support risk management. The position description, the application, the orientation and training, 
your policies and procedures. These are the kinds of things that are going to be looked at if something goes wrong. Um, and they matter a great deal to your insurance provider. He wants to know that you are doing these practices to minimize your risk. I'm going to talk about a few of these pieces uh, in the next few slides, but I can tell you that in the toolkit on page nine, there is more explanation about how each of these practices supports risk management. And on pages 10 through 12 is a very long list of possible policies that relate to volunteers. Now, don't be overwhelmed with this list. Not all of them are going to apply to your organization at all. But I think it's a helpful starting point to have a list like this so you can start identifying which of those policies you need to focus on developing in order to um, protect your organization and also protect your volunteers. So that wraps up that first um, bucket, if you will, of planning and getting ready for volunteers. And now we're going to move to the orange bucket. Um, which focuses on inviting people in, recruiting them, and onboarding them. As we begin to think about recruitment, it's helpful to look at these findings from the recent 2020 Civic Life Survey that was conducted nationally by Points of Light Organization. These are the most highly rated incentives in that survey. So you can see that being invited by a friend or someone that you know is a very uh, high, high low, highly rated uh, reason for saying yes to a volunteer opportunity, as is volunteering with my family. Family time competes hugely with volunteer time. So when we can combine those, it's very helpful. Having a place to find uh, op volunteer opportunities. I need to know about it before I can say yes to it. What are what are the benefits I can expect from it? And here's that big point I mentioned earlier, communication about impact, one of the highly rated incentives for saying yes. And then monthly reminders of those volunteer opportunities. So don't be afraid to mention something more than once. Um, in your publicity and your communication. Of course, there are lots of other factors that affect whether someone says yes to an opportunity or no. Um, and this list, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. It's giving some of these factors you can control, others you cannot. But it's worth giving some thought to which of these are significant benefits for your organization or challenges for your organization. For instance, if geography is, is a benefit, you're located right in the community, you're accessible, easily accessible to everyone in your area, then that's a plus and you can emphasize that in your recruitment. Talking with your colleagues and current volunteers about this list might, might be helpful as you think through again, which of these can we influence and do a better job promoting and which ones do we not have control over. Here are some general recruitment tips. First of all, you've got to believe. You've got to believe that this work is, is valuable and important. Um, even if it's uh, cleaning the porta potties for your big event, <laughs> Somebody's got to do it and you know why it is important to get done, right? So you don't need to be apologetic when you're talking about the volunteer opportunity to help with this. Um, the best recruiters are happy volunteers that are already doing tasks. So involve them in your recruitment. We apply marketing theory to volunteer recruitment today and just like if you were selling a, a, a car or a bottle of shampoo, you are selling an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to get involved in something that is very positive and helpful in your community and benefits everyone. So 
your passion for what you do is very contagious and that needs to be reflected in your recruitment. Secondly, if you are able to ask people in person, um, this is an advantage because you can pay attention to what people say. You can determine which part of your message is creating a positive reaction and what part brings a negative response. Someone may say, yes, I'd really love to do that, but I, I can't because of this. Then you can listen to that response and perhaps make an adjustment to help them be able to say yes. Thirdly, be organized. Most volunteers crave order because chaos generally wastes a lot of time. So get your act together before inviting other people to join in. That's why that planning piece is so important and the, the role description process that helps you uh, identify you know, transportation issues, scheduling, what kind of available support, who's going to be in charge, and what are the rules. Anticipate these questions before you start recruiting. Tell it like it is. No sugar coating. Your reputation is at stake and you want people to trust you. And that trust will be undermined if you aren't honest about what you are asking folks to do. And lastly, pay attention to organizational climate. You probably all know what I mean by that. Um, how does it feel to be involved in this activity? How does it feel to be part of your organization? Is it fun? Is there mutual respect? Is there high energy? Is there um, an opportunity for creativity? Those are all very positive characteristics of organizational time. It. So touch base with new volunteers after they, their first experience and um, talk, talk up your, your, how it feels to be part. In general, this is not rocket science. It's mostly common sense and a lot of strategic effort. <laughs> Okay, moving on to four different types of recruitment. These are pretty self-explanatory. You probably are using a lot of warm body recruitment, um, which means no skills or training needed. You're aiming for a very broad audience. You need lots of folks. Targeted is the opposite of that. It's very focused and you're only um, aiming your recruitment at specific types of people, um, specific types of skills. But sometimes that's what you need. Uh, concentric circles relies on all of the relationships you already have with your current volunteers, your staff, your clients, your um, vendors, your sponsors, uh, and it taps into their connections. So you are not having to reach all of those people. You're asking your current supporters to reach their networks on your behalf. And then lastly, ambient is, is when you tap into a closed system organization, such as a, a membership group, an employer, uh, a profession, and you work with one person in that group, and then um, they go and recruit their, um, their colleagues. In the toolkit on page 20, there is a recruitment plan worksheet to help you think through this a little more. And on page 21, there are some tips for diversifying your volunteer base if you want to reach out to some new audiences. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about what you're saying in your recruitment, what your message is. This is perhaps the most important aspect of recruitment today. Key questions that potential volunteers are most likely asking as they visit your website or see a social media post about a volunteer opportunity are these. What do you want from me and how much? So how much of my time, how much of my money? Why should I care about this? Why should I trust you? What's in it for me? And how is it different or unique, different from all of the other potential volunteer opportunities out there that I could say yes to? How might this opportunity give me something that I'm looking for? And then the so what? Again, as you've heard me say already several times, how is this going to really make a difference 
and have an Im and have some um, impact on our community. This is this one last one is really important and not necessarily um, immediately easy to answer. So I just want to give you a little bit more uh, information about that. What's required today in volunteer recruitment is to not only talk about what we're asking people to do, but the so what. So what difference is this making? Connecting what volunteers are doing to the results that you um, need and want to see happen. Some of the language that can be helpful in this conversation is telling telling me as a potential volunteer what problem I'm going to be solving by doing this. Even, even if it's clean, cleaning or um, monitoring the porta potty porta poly, potties. <laughs> um, you know, there, there are problems that can arise with those. You know what they are. And so if I agree to do that job, what am I going to be um, alleviating? What, what am I, what problem am I going to be preventing from happening? In other cases, it may be what need am I meeting? Um, how am I helping you be more efficient? How am I going to change some behavior or attitudes out there in the community? In trying to articulate this in your recruitment pitches and your communications, try um, answering this, this sentence. As a result of volunteers doing this specific task or activity, blank will happen. So we will be more efficient in our record keeping or um, we will be meeting the needs of um, local businesses to blah, blah, blah. OK, so it's it's just helpful to getting your mind thinking about this. Um, this is the kind of language that people want to hear in order to make their decision to say yes. Now I've given you some good examples in the toolkit on page 16. There's a develop there's a an example of a recruitment ad for a paid position, but I've highlighted some very intentional language that you don't often see in a job ad, which can conveys a lot of additional information to pot potential candidates. And then on page 17 and 18, there are sample social media message and website page, uh, flyers with quotes and photos, lots of different ways that you can convey benefits and impact. All right, so once we've recruited potential volunteers, we need to then onboard them. And this involves um, the process of gathering some information from them, matching them to a specific role that seems to be a good fit providing some orientation and some initial training. The whole point of this process of onboarding is to have clarity for everyone and consistency for all volunteers. So everyone goes through these steps and um, it, it again prepares people for um, a good relationship starting with you. On page 23 in the toolkit, there's a screenshot from a website of another organization that summarizes a simple onboarding process so you can see what I mean by that. One piece is the volunteer application or what may be better called an interest form where people can indicate their interest in working with you. There are lots of benefits to having this. Um, you want it accessible on your website. You want to be able able to um, email it to folks or have them submit it electronically. And on page 22 in the toolkit, there is a sample interest form, a very good one, from the Culpeper Main Street program. So take a look at that. Screening for the fit means placing volunteers who are a good fit for the job that you need them to do. Um, I think for uh, more specialized activities, not your big group events necessarily, but um, those regular volunteers you're going to be having, having to work with you over a period of time, 
the an interview is a great way to determine the fit. And um, these are just some sample questions that you might want to use that help you learn more about the person and um, help you to know whether it's going to work well in the future. Orientation for new volunteers. This is what we term, what we mean by this is preparing a new volunteer for a clear relationship with your organization. Um, it's making me as a new volunteer feel comfortable with your organization and understanding a little bit about how it works. It's like giving me a compass so that I know how to navigate in your environment. And all volunteers need it no matter what tasks they will be doing. So even for your big events when one time projects, um, even if your orientation only lasts 10 minutes, it's important to include um, as a first step in welcoming those volunteers and preparing them for what you need them to do. What do we include in orientation? Well, this is the three types of information that are often included and that can be very helpful. Again, you may not need to go into all of this with many of your volunteers, but just think about organizing and, and uh, your content along these three things, three buckets. Um, first of all, some background on your organization itself. Secondly, some information about how you operate, facilities, parking, some of the terminology and, ter and uh, jargon that you use, and of course, safety procedures. And then thirdly, um, something about the people, introducing to key people, um, how, we, how you were handle food. If my volunteer shift with you is going to be over a meal time, um, are you going to provide the food? If I, can I bring my food? If so, where do I put it? Um, those kinds of things. So lots of important information that you could include in orientation, um, depending on the situation. And then, of course, um, some volunteers are going to need some initial training before they start their assigned work. Others will be able to jump in right away with very little training. So this is a case by case basis. And um, it, it's not, it, it's necessary, obviously. It can involve information, um, do's and don'ts, teaching someone a, a skill. If I'm going to uh, work in parking, monitoring, or directing <laughs> during one of your big events, um, I'm going to need you to teach me what to do, to give me the, the tips on how you successfully handle guiding cars into um, where you want them parked. So, um, you know, simple things like that make a huge difference because, quote, nobody volunteers to fail. We all want to be successful. And this is a very important piece of helping me to be successful um, when I start with you. In the toolkit on page 24, there's an example of a first day checklist for that might be useful, especially if you're supervising some interns or other ongoing volunteers. Um, and so you might want to take a look at that. It's nice to have it written down. So no, ma no matter who's providing the orientation and the uh, onboarding, they will um, be consistent in the information they're sharing with volunteers. So that brings us to the third area of practices, the green circle, which involves supporting people once they are involved with us. <clears throat> Supervision is a very common word that is used a lot when we talk about working with volunteers as they go about their work. Um, it's one of the places where we've traditionally borrowed many practices and language from the HR world of paid staff, but it can feel a little negative or too bureaucratic and heavy too many folks to use it in relation to volunteers. So coaching is is often a better word to use. <clears throat> I think you um, can definitely speak to 
how the word supervision feels different from coaching. Um, and I think the it's it's one that is relevant and, and appropriate to use with volunteers. So how can we coach and support them? Um, and whose job is it to do that? Is it a staff person's job um, to be my coach and supporter? Or is it another experienced volunteer? Um, it could be either one. Bottom line, um, I heard someone said this to me years ago, be the supervisor or coach that you want for yourself. Think about the most effective supervisors you've ever had and strive to emulate that, which I think is, is very good advice. We clearly need to keep volunteers motivated so they keep doing what we need them to do and they maintain their passion and commitment to our organization. But we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that this is something we do to people. This quote from one of the original pioneers in our field explains what I mean. We don't create motivation. We identify it, accept it, and connect it creatively to organizational and community needs. <coughs> what Ivan is saying is that motivation already exists in each person. Our job is to provide an environment to tap into it, feed it, and harness its power. Volunteer motivation is fed by having shared goals, having mutual respect, um, giving me a sense of uniqueness, that you know that I'm a unique person and that the work I'm doing is, is real and important, and my feeling of success. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we know that volunteers today also are very eager to get connected with other people, um, especially in person after the pandemic. So promoting this sense of connection is, um, is something that's fairly easy to do. And here's a, a, a list of ways that, um, of things that do promote that, that feeling of identifying with your organization and um, and feeling like you're part of something uh, bigger than yourself. These are simple things we can do within our organization to strengthen that sense of belonging that everyone needs to feel. And most of it is, is just common sense. Um, I think personally that the Main Street programs have a real advantage in that area, in this area, because your mission is all about enhancing a single community. You're not focused on a specific client group or a specific cause. You are about the whole community. So being involved with you, um, just by the nature of it, connects me with lots of other kinds of people. Another piece of this um, area involves communication. Obviously, this it's important to keep people feeling connected with each other. I know a number of you have it appears have newsletters um, and electronic updates that go out periodically and that's that's wonderful. Um, make sure that you have lots of different kinds of um, information in them, not just uh, here's how you can volunteer. Here's where we need volunteers, but also some updates on things that are happening with your organization, some examples of um, success you've had, uh, highlighting a particular volunteer individual or a group um, that accomplished something specific. All of those kinds of information are will be very interesting to your volunteers and, um, and motivating. Some organizations uh, are, are setting up periodic touch based chats or office hours saying I'll be on Zoom um, Friday afternoon from four to six. Anybody, any volunteers who want to um, join in, we can chat. I'd love to hear what you're doing, uh, wh what's working for you, what's not. Um, how did you feel about that last um, activity that you were involved in uh, and give you some updates about our organization. So those kinds of informal ways for people to communicate with each other, with volunteers to communicate with each other. 
they're interested in hearing what each other is doing. So if you can provide opportunities for that, that's great. And on page 30 in the toolkit, you'll see a, uh, an excerpt from a particularly impressive volunteer newsletter um, that may give you some new ideas for content and design as you um, revisit your, your communication. Okay, recognition. Um, this is about acknowledging volunteers for their gifts of service and the ways they have helped us move our mission forward. Recognition matters a great deal. It's, it's certainly about gratitude, but it's also about impact. Um, remember what the survey data tells us that volunteers want to know what they that they really made a difference. So there's lots of reasons to do volunteer recognition and some important questions for your organization to answer. Um, especially what should we recognize? Uh, it, it's not just about hours um, or uh, the specific task they did. We might want to recognize someone for going above and beyond or for um, tackling something that was a particularly difficult project or, or uh, task. Making an impact is what matters most and the more you can share success stories um, in your social media, in your newsletters, uh, that will go a long way to um, recognizing and acknowledging what volunteers are doing. Here are some um, general tips and some other ideas about how you can do your acknowledgement and recognition. And um, on in the toolkit on page 34, there's a tip sheet about how acknowledgement is different from recognition, which could stimulate some fresh thinking for you. And on page 35, there's a template for creating a plan for volunteer recognition. And this can be a real help and in, in, uh, in the long over the long term in helping you space it out during the year and um, have it link to specific activities you're doing and just always thinking um, every time you involve a new group of volunteers, how are we going to say thank you um, in a meaningful way? Okay, so now we're in the last bucket of documenting and communicating activity and impact, the purple circle. Just a few um, bits of information about this one. This, this one is often the area of, of our practices that um, is overlooked or put on the back burner often. We don't feel like it's, it's urgently important and so it sometimes doesn't get done or doesn't get very much attention, but it's very important um, and people wanna know <laughs> this information. So what it involves is thinking about what our various stakeholders want to know about what's happening in our organizations with volunteers, and then deciding what we need to track, what data we need to capture, and how we're going to do that in order to give our stakeholders the information they want. This can also include assessing individual volunteer performance to ensure that the quality is there that you need. It's not necessary in all cases, but in some it is. And then managing that feedback loop of uh, closing the communication gaps and making sure people are getting feedback as they um, want and need. So just quickly, what do I mean by stakeholders? Uh, and what they want to know? Well, here are just some examples. First of all, the, the places, institutions that may supply your volunteers and your external funders. They have questions. Your board members have questions. Your staff has questions about is, is the is quality work getting done? Is it worth my time to supervise and support volunteers? And then lastly, volunteers themselves, of course, want to know, as, as we've been saying, um, 
Am I really making a difference? And does the organization value what I'm doing? So how, how do we get this? What do I mean by the answers to these questions? How are we going to get the answers to these questions? What kind of data do we need to be uh, capturing? Well, think about an iceberg on the surface that we can easily see. We know we can count the number of volunteers that are involved with us, the number of hours perhaps that they are uh, giving to us, and we can calculate a dollar value of an hour of each hour of their volunteer time. This historically, traditionally has been the way that we have talked about volunteer activity and impact, because these numbers are pretty easy to, connect, to collect and to track. It's what we've um, been doing for decades and it's worth doing. And I know that you are required to turn in uh, volunteer hours to the state Main Street office, um, and that's good. Um, there are ways to calculate, there are about three ways to calculate the numerical value of volunteer time. And in the toolkit on page 43 and 44, these three ways are explained. If you're not familiar with them, you may want to take a look at it. However, we don't want to stop there because we also want to look at what's below the surface, below the water on the iceberg. This gives us a much fuller, more complete ways to talk about volunteer impact and contributions, because this, these are the outcomes of volunteer activity, or maybe. By focusing on these additional aspects of volunteer involvement, we begin to communicate a much fuller picture of why volunteers are important and valuable to our organizations. On page 45 in the toolkit, there's a list of possible indicators. There are many of them, um, but it could be helpful to you as you consider what you are currently tracking and sharing with various stakeholders. And there are also three examples of impact reports that other uh, organizations, other nonprofits profits have um, produced. So again, this is um, requires some thought and some focus to do it well, but I encourage you to tackle it. And also it could be a very, very good project for uh, a little task force of perhaps uh, one or two experts from the community who who are um, have a background in evaluation, and then um, a few of your long-term volunteers to come up with a system and um, some decisions about what you're tracking, and and how you're going to articulate the uh, true picture of volunteer, the full picture of what volunteers are contributing. When we think about evaluation, it's also important to be sure that we include the volunteers themselves. The more we understand about their experience with us, the better we can make changes to be even more effective and efficient. And there are three tools here that I think are especially helpful. One, the volunteer satisfaction survey. Um, this is something you can do quickly after a, an event or you to just one group of volunteers or you could do it to all your volunteers um, once a year. And uh, I have some samples of these. Um, if you if you need them, you're welcome to contact me. I'm happy to share them. Um, there is also a um, sample in your toolkit on pages 37 to 40. There's also a sample of an exit survey, which is done when people leave. It's especially valuable for episodic or regular volunteers. And then the third one is this individual performance evaluation. Um, again, not something that you would use um, with everybody, but I know in one of the Main Street trainings I conducted, we had an organization that had a volunteer serving as their bookkeeper 
So she was she had been with them for two years. So she's an example of a skilled volunteer um, who's doing a very important uh, job for the organization, which could be a staff position, but it's not. It's a volunteer role. And so she deserves a performance check in and check in is perhaps the preferred way to think about this. It, it needs to be a, a two way exchange. Um, what's working, what's not a great way to, uh, opportunity to reinforce what she's doing that is really working well and that you're you're very happy with and um, also providing any constructive criticism or feedback that will help things um, be better for her and for you. So there's a sample of one of those in your toolkit as well. Lastly, um, what data are we going to, do we need to track and maintain? Um, these are possible documents that you might want to um, have in your files. It's just important to have this easily accessible. And I know the file folders is a is an antiquated um, system these days for most people. But even if they're on electronic files, make sure things are stored and organized in a way that anybody can find them quickly. Um, organizing all your records could be a really great job for the right volunteer. Personally, it's something I love to do. <laughs> so you, uh, you know, you can find somebody who would be happy to help you with this if you feel that this needs some more attention. If you haven't taken a strategic look at your data management related to volunteers, I encourage you to do so. Consider forming a task force of a couple of current volunteers, perhaps a previous board member and or a skilled external volunteer who's familiar with your organization and is good at analysis. They could focus on these questions about what you're collecting, what you're not collecting, and how is it connected to other data in the organization? And how could you, what, what technology are you using? Um, on page 46 of the toolkit, there's a list of some additional resources that relate to um, much of what we've been talking about, including a few of the major software platforms that are focused on volunteer tracking. So, We've now reached the end of our circle, our framework. Um, as you know, training like this is usually best when it leads us to specific actions to improve our work in the community. So I encourage you right now to take a few minutes to consider this question, to think about what you've heard in this video and what are two or three ideas that you'd like to explore further or implement in your particular organization. Make a few notes now while it's all fresh in your mind and there the last page of the toolkit actually gives you a, a worksheet to do this on if that's helpful. But capture it before you turn off the video and um, before you are bombarded with all of the other daily tasks that's on your desk uh, and hopefully it will uh, benefit you and you can follow up with some real activity that is beneficial to your organization. Last you, lastly, I want to thank you for tuning in. I am happy to communicate with anyone in the future if you have questions about anything that was covered today. My contact information is on the first slide of the deck. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for what you do in your community, which then reflects across the entire state of Virginia. And as a resident of Virginia, I am very grateful for that. May the force be with you. Take care. <laughs>